Well, everyone, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 CBD, the makers of premium raw CBD oil products. Take, for example, their chill tincture blend, which is perfect to help us relax and recharge and be ready for a new day every day. And if you're like me, you know, not really old, but you're not also a young man anymore, you know, sometimes our AGE acts up. Their Alleviate Tincture is there to help with the inflammation, sore muscles, and stiff joints that sometimes mysteriously show up. And and right now, they've got something really exciting going on. They've got a new summer flavor coming out. And they want to invite you to stop by any of their retail locations. And they have a store in Ventura, California. They have one in Ojai, California, one in Denver, Colorado, and one in Omaha, Nebraska. So if you're nearby and you have a chance, why don't you come on in, sample that new flavor, and let them know what you think about it. You can also help name that new flavor on social media. Just leave your suggestion at 101CBD. Now, when you do go over to 101CBD.org and order yourself a chill or an alleviate tincture, don't forget to save yourself some money by using the coupon code IMGS25 so you can get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's start the show. Well, brothers and sisters, hello again. This is the In My Grow Show, the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. I'm your host, Alex. And I want to thank you once again for taking the time to listen to me. I truly do appreciate it. And I hope everyone is doing awesome today. I hope everyone's gardens are doing great. Me, myself, I'm doing awesome. Thank you for asking. Now, a little later, I am going to play a conversation that I had with Nick Tennant from Precision Extraction Solutions. Because he was nice enough to come on and talk about uh, cannabis and hemp extraction. But before that, let's uh, talk about a couple of things. So you know what I've noticed is lately, and I kind of touched on this last time, is that a lot more people are growing cannabis for the first time. And it seems like it's the perfect storm because of, one, the quarantine, and also just the fact that, you know, we're more comfortable with talking about cannabis. And it's also really easy to learn how to grow cannabis from different places. You know, just the Internet alone has changed the uh, people's ability to access information about how to grow cannabis. Uh, So that's why I say that it's kind of this perfect storm that kind of came together and is really pushing people to just take that chance and learn a new skill in the garden. You know, and I think it's awesome. I think it's great. I think everybody should learn how to grow cannabis. You know, and if you can't grow cannabis because of the state you live in or the country you live in, think about growing hemp. Look into what it takes. What are the laws that restrict you from growing hemp? It's the same kind of... Both plants grow exactly the same. But from what I've noticed from growing hemp, and I haven't grown a lot of hemp, okay? I've grown like two plants. So don't take this as like I, I, I'm a master hemp grower. I'm not, I've, you know. But what I have noticed is that it seems like the hemp plants seem to have or seem to yeah hemp plants seem to have less pest pressure they seem to deal with it better that's the main difference that i've noticed between cannabis and hemp and growing both of them so because so many new people are are taking the chance at growing hemp i've decided to uh put together an actual like you know from seed to harvest series of how to grow cannabis at home how to how to make your own uh, cannabis garden and i'm calling it cannabis gardening 101 You know, I'm just going to be talking about the easiest way that I know of that I learned how to grow cannabis in soil. So, uh, yeah, if you're a new home grower, if you know somebody who's just starting to grow, you know, check it out or pass it along. So staying on the topic of of a new home grower, a a buddy of mine who's just growing cannabis for the first time, calls me up, not so much in a panic, but kind of concerned that he because he was seeing um, these gnats on his topsoil. And I told him that more than likely they were fungus gnats. And the reason they're there is because they really like to hang out in the wet topsoil of a plant. That's their little playground, you know. They, they really love a wet soil. And they're not really that harmful unless you just, like, don't pay attention to them and don't do anything to kind of fight them or mitigate it. Because like any pest, if you don't try to manage them, they will do damage to your plant. At the very least, they're going to stunt the growth. So what I suggested to him was since his plant was in a three-gallon nursery pot, you know, those black pots... I told him to put that pot in a drip tray. You know, those drip trays are probably only about an inch and a half, maybe two inches deep. And I told him that on watering days to water the drip tray, fill the drip tray up. Because what's going to happen is that plant will get watered by what's called capillary action or a wicking action. 
you know, the, the pot, the soil is going to absorb the water from the bottom up. And I suggested to him to fill it once, you know, leave it alone for like 10, 15 minutes, come back, fill it again, because usually the water level is going to drop. And I usually don't fill those drip trays for a three gallon, more than three, maybe four times. At the fourth time, there's still a little bit of water left over. Um, you can either suck it out with like a turkey baster or something, or just leave it in there. So what's going to happen is that because of that capillary action, because of that wicking action, the plant is going to self-regulate how much water it takes up. And it'll take up as much water as that soil can hold, but yet leave those first top two inches dry. It's not going to be very attractive for uh, fungus gnats. So you'll see that fungus gnat number drop significantly. You know, there's no if there's no wet top soil, there's no playground for them to want to be attracted to. So, you know, that number will drop. So that's the easiest solution I had for him for his fungus gnats. You know, and the other thing I wanted to talk about was that for about the last four weeks, I've been microdosing psilocybin. I have access to these uh, psilocybin chocolates, and each one has three grams of psilocybin in it. So I've been taking about 20 milligrams for about two weeks, and I started with 10 milligrams about a month ago, and I'm taking it every three days, and it seems to be working pretty good. You know, I've, I've definitely noticed uh, my attention is a lot sharper, my creativity is a lot better, or at least a lot quicker, I guess you could call it. It's kind of hard to explain the creativity part. So right now I'm at 20 milligrams, and to be honest with you, I'm going to take it up to see what my threshold level is. You know, I want to see at what point do I actually see any kind of visuals or see any kind of new tracers. I say new tracers because... Um, when I was a young man, I did do a lot of uh, uh, psychedelics, and I occasionally have the acid flashback. You know, I occasionally have, like, more tracers than usual about things, you know. Um, but uh, while I'm doing the psilocybin, I have not seen any new tracers or any kind of new visuals. <laughs> and one of the things that I had read is that one of the first signs that you've taken too much psilocybin is that you get sleepy. I haven't felt that either. So now before I started microdosing psilocybin, I did talk to a doctor friend of mine, Dr. Felice. He, he did explain to me it wasn't his area of expertise, but, you know, he's the one who suggested, you know, start low and work your way up. He also, he also suggested to take notes, you know, to see how I felt before, during, and afterwards, you know, all of that stuff, just to see if it's actually helping or doing what I wanted to do. And I'll keep you updated to where I'm actually at as far as what's my threshold level. And I say I'm... <clears throat> Now, when I say 20 milligrams, hold on. Now, when I say I'm taking 20 milligrams, um, I, I don't know how exact that is. The food scale that I have only goes down to grams. So I had to do some like kitchen math, you know, how many tablespoons and this and that and the other. So I say 20, about 20, 20, mil, 20, 22 milligrams is where I'm at, more or less. I'm taking a quarter tablespoon. No, I'm taking, I'm taking a quarter teaspoon of this psilocybin chocolate, which according to my math comes out to about 20 milligrams right now. I could be wrong. I could be taking more. I could be taking less, but I say it's about that much. So keep that in mind. If you want to start uh, microdosing, find yourself a food scale or some way to actually uh, uh, measure a milligram. I think that's going to be really helpful. But that's also why I suggest, you know, starting low and then working your way up. That's what I'm doing. All right, now let's do the strain of the week. And today we're going to talk about the Purple Punch, which is an indica-heavy cross of the Larry OG and the Granddaddy Purple, or the Granddaddy Perp. And it has a nice, sweet, piney taste and smell to it. And this and this flower that I got had some really great bag appeal, you know. It was nice and frosty looking. And, you know, it was really fluffy, real moist, a little sticky. And the high was kind of a medium high. It came in at about a 19% THC. Um, the thing I didn't really enjoy about it was that it did zap my motivation a little bit, and I blame that fully on the uh, heavy indica strain that it is. But the zapping of motivation wasn't too bad. I kind of I was able to fight through it. Um, you know, I know a lot of people who like the Purple Punch. It, it's really popular, and I can see why. Again, great taste, you know, real subtle high. At least for me, it was really subtle. wasn't too heavy. Um, now, the pretentious internet says that the Purple Punch is a delicious dessert strain. So um, my, my question is, what makes it a dessert strain? Is it that it has a fruity taste or because, you know, the Internet suggests that you have it like as, at the end of a meal, like a dessert wine? What the fuck does that mean? 
When I hear when I hear like a dessert strain, it makes me think like I'm gonna have a Twinkie and a bowl of the purple punch. Anyways, that's my dessert. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, man, Purple Punch. Find it. Go check it out. Let me know what you think. As I said, a lot of people like it. That's okay. I like the flavor. The high is okay for me. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about what's in my social media. So I'm going to talk about something that is super hyper local. Okay. It only affects people who live in the Ventura County area of the 805 area code out here in California. Okay, it says the Ventura County Pilot Cannabis Cultivation Program will put before voters an option to form a small-scale pilot program with regulatory and oversight frameworks in place to ensure responsible cannabis cultivation in unincorporated Ventura County using existing, pre-existing, permanent greenhouse facilities only. So remember a few months ago when I said that, like, Ventura County supervisors, like, voted to... um, really scale back the amount of cultivation that can be done in the unincorporated parts of this county. They put it back like half a mile from any structure that isn't, you know, associated with that grow operation or associated with that, that cultivation farm. And that is a, uh, a ridiculous regulation. So it sounds like that this pilot program is coming out of, of that thinking of trying to correct that. So if you do live in Ventura County, there is a petition going around. You can order a peti- you can ask for them to send you a petition so you can sign it and send it back so we can put this measure on the ballot and take a vote now the website to go to to get more information about that is vccannabispetition.org there's also going to be a link in the show notes for it so yeah if you are in Ventura County uh, come out and support cannabis I'm trying to get someone from this organization to come on the podcast I'm having a little bit of trouble so if you know someone who's a part of this do me a favor, let them know I'd like to talk to them. Uh, send them my information, send them my email in my grow at gmail.com. Uh, I just need a way that I can reach out to somebody and talk to them. I want to get them on the show and we can talk about this. All right, now let's go on to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And we're going to start with an article that came out in Frontiers in Psychology. And it's entitled, Totality of Evidence Suggests Prenatal Cannabis Exposure Does Not Lead to Cognitive Impairment, a Systemic Critical Review. So it turns out that some doctors got together to review a lot of different studies that have been published. You know, they pulled them from PsychInfo, PubMed, and Google Scholar, just to see how true it was of the idea that uh, cannabis is bad for, for pregnant women. Because public opinion of cannabis use by pregnant women is pretty negative. And there isn't a whole lot of scientific information to really back up that negativity. You know, it seems to be a lot of um, anecdotal evidence or people just be, you know, just having emotional reactions about using any kind of drug uh, during pregnancy. And I understand why. I can see why. Um, But these doctors, after looking over a bunch of these articles, here's what they concluded. It says the current evidence does not suggest that prenatal cannabis exposure alone is associated with clinically significant cognitive function impairment. So basically what they found after reviewing all of these uh, documents and research papers is that, uh, you know, um, there really is no scientific evidence to say that uh, cannabis use during pregnancy affects children negatively in the long term i want to suggest that you go to the link in the show notes about this and read this article it's a really because i'm just giving you a truly truly condensed version of a very long article and please remember i'm not a scientist i'm not a doctor i'm not a psychologist i'm just a guy with a microphone telling you the headlines Uh, but yeah go over there check it out and read it it is uh, it's pretty interesting you know what else you got to do you're quarantined That's a joke. I'm kidding. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. Relax. All right. The next article comes from the Growth Op, and it was written by Angela Stelmakowick. Angela Stelmakowick. God, I hope I got that right. It's entitled, A 35 Million Brick Weed Bust Prompts a Lot of Questions. Mainly, who is still buying brick weed? That is a very good question. All right, but let's read it. The day didn't end well for three men and a woman who have been arrested in what's believed to be Jamaica's largest drug bust ever. Last week, police seized 8,700 pounds of compressed cannabis or brick weed within an estimated street value of $35 million, reports the Jamaica Constable Force. I guess that's Jamaica's police force? 
After executing search warrants on two premises in Manchester, a parish of south-central Jamaica, the drugs and a motor vehicle were seized. Despite common stereotypes, cannabis was not decriminalized in Jamaica until 2015, and some rules remain, including that adults are only allowed to grow as many as five plants at a time and can possess no more than two ounces without charge with, without chancing criminal. Let me try that again. Without chancing criminal penalties. Legalization has, to a large extent, upended the quality of cannabis and sent brickweed, poor quality marijuana that's been compressed into the shape of a brick to allow for easy transportation and smuggling. So yeah, there you go, man. Somewhere out in the world, brickweed is still just being hustled, man. You know, apparently there still is a very deep, deep need for weed. Uh, you know, am I surprised a little bit, mostly because I'm spoiled here in California? I mean, brickweed, I haven't seen brickweed me personally since like 98 and that's because um that's about the year i left texas and came to california yes in 98 i was still getting brick weed from texas i'm not surprised but anyways um the most surprising part of this is that uh 8500 pounds or what was it 80 8700 pounds that 8700 pounds is the biggest drug bust or the biggest cannabis bust in jamaica and it's surprising because it's jamaica i, I think that you know weed you know is grown everywhere in jamaica I don't know. And I mostly think that because I've never been to Jamaica yet. Now, the final thing I want to read is a report that came out of the United Nations entitled COVID-19 is changing the route of illicit drug flows. Starts off, measures implemented by governments to curve the COVID-19 pandemic have led to drug trafficking routes by air being disrupted, along with drastic reductions or increased interdictions in traffic routes over land. Some drug supply chains have been interrupted and traffickers are looking for alternative routes, including maritime routes, depending on the type of drugs smuggled. These are some of the findings from the report on drug market trends during COVID-19. Synthetic drugs such as methamphetamines tend to be trafficked across continents by air more than other types of drugs. Restrictions on air travel are therefore likely to have particularly drastic effects on the illegal cargo. The bulk of cocaine is trafficked by sea, and large cargoes have contributed, oh nope, have continued to be detected in European ports during the pandemic. So cocaine is smuggled mostly through through ships, and I guess since a lot of cargoes in ports, they're going through and inspecting a lot of it and finding a whole bunch of cocaine, I guess. So far, heroin has mostly been trafficked by land. But due to the pandemic, maritime routes seem to be increasingly seem to be increasingly used now to traffic heroin as shown by seizures of opiates in the Indian Ocean. Aha. So instead of going over land, heroin's coming from the ocean now, or from across, you know, somewhere. It's coming by boat. All right, now here's, now, all right, now here's the one I'm interested in. Trafficking in cannabis, however, may not be affected in the same way as that of heroin or cocaine, given that its production often takes place near consumer markets and traffickers are thus less reliant on long transregional shipments and large quantities of drugs of large quantities of drugs. So there you go, man. Even the illicit uh, uh, drug trade and, you know, drug shipping, uh, cannabis is still king, it seems. And this is just the first part of this report. It's a really interesting read. Um, there is a link in the show notes. Check it out. It's really, a, to me, it was a fun read <laughs> just to see the way trends are going because it also talks about, like, drug consumption trends during the, the uh, quarantine and um, trends in drug production. So, yeah. In the show notes, check it out. All right, now let's start talking about Cannabis Gardening 101. And before you even buy any seeds to start your cannabis garden, there are a few questions you need to ask yourself, in my opinion. You know, first of all, I want to congratulate you on taking a bold step in gardening. You know, it's natural that you're going to feel a little nervous, a little, a little hesitant when you take on a new project. Um, but I just want to reassure you, you know, if, if you can grow a tomato plant, you can grow cannabis. And I want you to know that there is no single perfect way to grow cannabis. As a matter of fact, eventually every gardener winds up with their own style of growing. Now, are you going to have to learn some new vocabulary words? Yes. Are your hands going to get dirty? Yes. Are we going to have fun learning how to grow cannabis? Absolutely, man. I, I guarantee you that you're going to turn into one of those people that will just sit outside and stare at their cannabis plants for no reason. You're going to find yourself doing that, I promise. And my hope is that by the end of this series of uh, Cannabis Garden 101... 
is you'll be able to use that cannabis flower without worrying about how it was grown because you'll, you're going to know exactly the kind of inputs that, that went into growing it. Another benefit to having a cannabis garden is that you won't always have to pay those high dispensary prices. And that's an important thing, especially if you're a cannabis patient on a fixed income, because none of that cannabis that you buy for your condition is covered by any insurance that I know of. And also, if you're a recreational user on a fixed income, you know, you can also grow your own recreational cannabis, again, without having to always rely on high dispensary prices. And we're also going to show you ways to make tinctures, edibles, and topicals with that cannabis flower that you just grew. You know, and on a more personal note, our hope is that as you learn how to grow cannabis and become part of a cannabis community, that you'll also become an advocate for it. You know, hopefully you'll become involved in shaping your local cannabis laws and regulations since, you know, it is going to affect you. Now, the simplest way I know how to teach someone how to grow cannabis is in soil, in a container, outside. It is the simplest and the cheapest way that I know of. And, and those are the techniques that we're going to focus on in this series of Cannabis Garden 101. Now, before you jump into the internet looking for information on how to grow cannabis, because there is a lot of it and very confusing, there are a few questions, like I said earlier, that I think you need to ask yourself. And these questions are aimed at people who, by law, are able to grow cannabis legally. Because there are a lot of heavy consequences if you grow cannabis illegally. I just want you to know that. But please don't be discouraged because um, even if you can't grow cannabis legally in your state, you can still grow hemp. Hemp is still a legal plant, okay? And they grow exactly the same, very similar. So keep that in mind. So the first question is, how do people that you live with feel about you growing cannabis? Make sure that your husband, your wife, your roommates know that you're growing cannabis and make sure that they're okay with it. Because one of the things that can be a problem in your cannabis garden is when the cannabis starts to flower, it does have a distinctive smell and some people don't like it. So just to keep the peace at home, make sure everyone's okay with it. Make sure they understand what you're going to do and what's going to happen. Now also, why are you starting to grow cannabis? Is Are you a medical patient? Is it just recreational? You're going to want to know this also because um, in some states, in some places, you do get more leniency if you're a medical patient than you are if you're recreational. So again, this is where the law comes in. Please know your plant limitations. The next question is, do you have time to grow cannabis? Typically, you're going to need about 10 minutes a day per plant, depending, um, you know, depending on what phase of growth they are. The more mature your plant is, the more attention they're going to need from you. So think about that. And then you have to think about how much room can you dedicate to your new garden. That's going to be really important. You're going to have to plan ahead because, yes, plants, like anything alive, starts off small and they wind up getting bigger as they mature. And then one of the bigger questions about starting your garden is your budget. Can you afford, you know, 75, 100 bucks for a 10 pack of seeds? Yes, seeds from a reputable seed bank and reputable breeder will cost you about that much. Now, you may be able to find seed exchanges online. There's a couple of really good ones. Strainly.io is a really good one. Please be very careful because there are a lot of shysters in the seed game. Okay, that's why I tell people to go to a reputable seed bank. But if you know someone who can give you seeds or maybe you find seeds in some, in some weed you just bought, you can use those too. You know, but please uh, get your seeds from a reputable company they, because, you know, they're not cheap and it really sucks to get ripped off. Now I want to give a quick note about security. Uh, make sure your garden is out of sight of prying eyes because you may live in a state or in a place where it's legal for you to, to grow cannabis or to even grow hemp. You know, so you're safe from the law coming in and kicking your door down. But if your garden is somewhere where a stranger may walk by, you know, it's very possible they could steal one of your plants. So try to be a little stealthy when you're, when you're picking out that spot to, to start your garden at. On that same note of it being out of sight, you also have to remember that um, a flowering cannabis plant does have a very distinct odor, and it's not really easy to mask that odor. Now, I had read somewhere that a single flowering cannabis plant, that that odor can drift up to 60 feet, depending on which way the wind's blowing. I don't know how scientifically true that is. Sounds about right, but... Uh, yeah, just, you know, take odor into consideration when you're also planning your cannabis garden. Again, because, you you know, you still want to have some, some form of security in mind when you're putting this together. And the last thing that I'm going to stress when starting a cannabis garden, okay, I don't want to discourage anybody. I love the idea. I'm, I'm really proud of you for wanting to try it. If I can help you in any way, you reach out and, you know, you can ask me a question. But please... 
please know the law where you live about growing cannabis. Because if it is not legal, there are all kinds of really heinous consequences to you getting busted growing cannabis. Another thing about that is even if you do live in a state or in a place where they allow can where they allow you to grow cannabis, please be aware if there are any consequences for you growing cannabis if you live in public housing. Because there is a chance that you could lose that public housing if they catch you growing cannabis. Now you may ask, well, what about hemp? Is it the same thing for hemp? I don't know. Okay. Commercial CBD hemp and cannabis look exactly, smell exactly the same. It is hard for anyone without a lab test to tell whether a plant just by sight and smell is hemp or cannabis. And if you live in public housing, I don't know if that's a fight you want to take on. Like I said, just be aware of the law. <clears throat> wow, I'm losing my voice. And those are the basic questions that I think you should answer before you start your cannabis garden. Next time, I'm going to go over the differences between male and female plants and the different strains, you know, indica, sativa, and ruderalis, and maybe even go into some seed selection. We'll see how time does. But that is Cannabis Gardening 101 for today. All right, now, next, I'm going to play a conversation that I had with Nick Tennant, who is with Precision Extraction Solutions. He came on to talk about a couple of new techniques that they developed, but while I had him on the show, we explained a little bit about what winterizing is. Uh, we went over a little bit about color remediation and also, you know, just some notes about uh, what a distillate is or how a distillate's made or why it's used. So I want you all to hang tight. I'm going to play a little bit of music and then I'm going to put that on for you. So everyone... Today with me on the show, on the phone, I've got Nick Tennant from Precision Extraction Solutions, which is really great because I want to talk a little bit about a couple of steps that are taken um, when cannabis extracts and hemp extracts are made. Nick, buddy, hey, uh, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for taking the time to come on. Hey, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Hey, so before we get into the conversation, can you do me a favor and uh, could you tell everybody what Precision Extraction Solutions does? Sure, absolutely. So Precision Extraction Solutions was started by myself about seven years ago uh, when I saw the trend of everything in, in cannabis going towards extracts. Uh, obviously, a lot of people just consumed flour at the time. So we started looking at a lot of the technologies that they were using to make these concentrates, to make these extracts and refinement methodologies, and they were very primitive. Um, so we made some machines that essentially did it better. And today we've uh, transformed into an organization of 63 people. Um, we've got some of the uh, the biggest brands in the world that use our equipment. And not only are we equipment manufacturers, but we're also specialty process integrators. So, for example, if your company wants to make, um, you know, a candy bar with distillate or a special formulation for a vape cartridge or any sort of isolates or crystallines or things like that, that's all things that we readily know how to do. We know how to not only size and uh, manufacture the equipment to do such processes, but also we actually come in, train you. Uh, integrate the process fully and in a compliant uh, manner into your facility with your staff. So now you guys have developed um, a couple of new techniques, one called the LSEP, which can help with winterization, and another one called the TSEP, which, you know, is going to kind of help with uh, making distillates or, you know, distilling uh, terpenes from one another, if I understand it correctly. But I, I want to take each one of those separately, and I was hoping, could you explain what winterization does in the extraction process real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So um, winterization is a process, uh, put quite simply, of re removing fats and lipids. So if you've ever touched a, a cannabis or a hemp plant or any plant, really, for that matter, and you, you kind of like rub the leaf between your fingers, you get kind of that waxy substance. And those wax waxy substance... Uh, that you're feeling is is lipids, and that could be a number of you know phospholipids and different triglycerides and things like that that the plant actually inherently makes in its uh, in its anatomy in order to protect itself from the elements. What happens is when we extract, particularly when we use a warmer solvent, it'll dissolve those lipids in the extract. Um, now the the amount and types of lipids will vary based upon the plant, based upon the solvent that you're using, but in almost all cases, unless you're doing a very low temperature extraction, you're always going to pick up those lipids. And even with a low temperature extraction, you're going to pick up some of those lipids. So 
what happens is those lipids generally are not desirable in an end, end extract because uh, if you can imagine, you know, like uh, burning uh, olive oil or burning bacon grease uh, as you're oxidizing those lipids when you're burning them, um, they're undesirable in the end product. So we we aim to remove those and the process of winterization is the process of actually removing those lipids. And what happens is in winterization is we're able to manipulate the temperature of a solvent and oil matrix that's dissolved in there. And when we lower the temperature, that effectively crystallizes the, uh, the lipids within solution, which then become solid, obviously, and they can be filtered out via standardized filter. So if you can think of something like bacon grease, um, you know, if bacon grease is warm on the stove. Uh, if you cool down that bacon grease, say you put it in the fridge or you put it in the freezer, those lipids are then going to turn into a solid form. Essentially, that's what we're doing. And then we're able to filter those lipids out. And, um, you know, the unfortunate scenario is, is that it takes a, a drastic amount of temp temperature manipulation, which takes a lot of energy, a lot of time, um, which is why we've kind of uh, focused on new techniques in order to optimize that process. So I, I want to take you back a little bit about... Um you know what just why we don't want those fats in our in our concentrates or in that raw oil and you know again the fats are going to really dilute that percentage of the oil that we want the good cannabinoids i assume and then with all those fats it also makes the oil if i understand it right a lot more darker as well and yeah nobody really likes to look at dark oil when they're looking for to making concentrates you know everybody likes that kind of that honey color that amber you know not so amber and as you were saying also those fats even if when we put, you know, if we let them go through, or if they're not, you know, taken away or filtered out, like you were talking about, if they wind up in like, let's say a vape pen, they could wind up just leaving the vape pen kind of having a burnt kind of taste to them or smell. Um, so as you were saying, it's so we get this oil that's already been pressed or extracted in some way, and we cool it down in a big refrigerator, right? That's basically the temperature, and it takes, from what I understand, like almost 24 hours. Maybe it could take longer to really let that oil and those fats separate. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen it happen, you know, in an optimized process as short as six hours. But again, if you're doing something like that, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of energy. If you can imagine, um, you know, 100 liters or, say, a 25-liter uh, bucket, which would be like five five-liter buckets, imagine putting that in a freezer and how long that's going to take to come down to temp. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of, of, um, of thermal capacity that you need to bring that down, depending on the scale you're running at. Obviously, when you get to an even larger scale, it becomes, you know, more ineffective, uh, because you're talking about potentially thousands of liters of solvent that need to go down to a very low temperature in order to, uh, have that winterization process take place. So now then this new technique, you guys came up with this, uh, LSEP. Can you explain that a little more, um, because I did see some literature on it, but uh, it, it, you guys yeah, take away yeah. a lot so, of that so time. So LSEP correct? is, yeah, LSEP is a uh, exactly what we just previously discussed. It's a lipid methodology, a lipid removal methodology process. And what we found is we found a proprietary ratio um, as well as some additives that we can put in those solvents to rapidly crystallize those lipids out of solution at room temperature. So something that, you know, you used to have to take, you know, hundred, hundreds of liters of solution and manipulate the temperature down to, you know, zero or negative 40 or whatever you're winterizing at over a long period of time, we can now add additives to these solvents and do an instantaneous crystallization of those lipids and be able to remove those. Uh, and it takes a very, very short period of time, about six minutes um, generally is, is what it takes, you know, shortening that obviously anywhere from six hours to 24 hours traditionally. So it's a very, very valuable process. So now when you say that now, now sometimes in, in, you know, let's, let's call it traditional winterization, you know, just putting it in the, in, in, in a cold room, in a, in a cooler, um, after it is filtered, sometimes, you know, it's a good process to go back, take a sample and then refreeze it or recool it down just to see, to make sure it's not too cloudy. With the LSEP, do you suggest people still do that, or does it pretty much crystallize it all? No, I mean, uh, uh, we, we've we obviously gone through that research in R&D, and ultimately um, we're able to remove, you know, 99.9% .9 of the lipids. A very, very high proportion of the lipids are removed. Um, you know, we've already done back testing where we've re redissolved the, um, the finished oil into multiple different uh, – solvents and 
you know, tried to recrystallize at very, very low temps, put them in a negative 80 deep freezer, negative 60 deep freezer, fluctuated the temperatures. So this is all protocol that our R&D team's already gone through. So uh, we know that the process is extremely effective. And uh, yeah, no need to kind of guess and check the work from the client because that's, you know, we've already done that work up front, of course. Nice, nice. Now, are, now speaking of solvents, are, are you able to um, recapture those solvents and use them again? Yep, absolutely. Really? Yep, All the solvents, just wow. like any other solvent you would use or dissolve your micella into, it's just evaporated and recaptured. Wow, and you've got it down, you said to six minutes? Wow, that's amazing, brother, right on. Yeah, it's very, 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 very rapid. It's almost instantaneous. I mean, as soon as you can really get the the oil to go in solution with our solvent um it's almost an instantaneous separate separation the lipids will almost instantly crystallize and it's a real bonus as far as time it sounds like because especially right now at least speaking in california new ways with the high cost of regulation um you know a lot of companies a lot of companies that produce extracts or use um concentrates to make their product uh, they're counting their half pennies because of that, man. You know, it it is yeah. a, it is not a, a an inexpensive thing to do. No, absolutely not. No, it's um, every efficiency in in the process. Look at in mature markets like California, uh, you're going to have guys that have been you know in the extraction game for seven eight years that are going to know the best techniques, that are going to have the most efficient processes, and are going to have substantial throughput. And ultimately, what that means is they're going to run their business at um, a profitability standpoint that is going to drive the market price of, of the commodity or of the oil down. So, you know, they're operating off a 20% EBITDA margin or whatever it is, and they're comfortable on that. So new entrants need to be cognizant if they're going into a mature market with many mature um, constituents in it, that it's very important to understand the efficiencies of your process and how um, how your cost and your throughputs of those processes are going to work with your with your P&L and how your business is going to be profitable. So um, every step along the way, every every hour saved, every step saved, uh, you know, every um, every liter of solvent retained, those those all add up. And ultimately, it's uh, it's a game of efficiencies. Now, let, let's switch over a little bit. And um, can you talk about like distillates? Where would like a regular customer come in contact with a product that has a distillate or what is a distillate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so distillates, uh, let me describe the, the product a little bit. So if you think about comparing it to oil coming out of the ground, like regular oil, oil can be turned into gasoline, kerosene, which are all effectively distillates of oil. And this is kind of the same principle. We have generally a crude oil coming out of the plant. So we're doing our first pass of extraction. We're getting that crude oil. Um, that crude oil will have any number of adulterants in it that are undesirable, whether it's lipids, chlorophylls. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, the lipids and the discoloration from the chlorophylls previously. The goal is to remove all that. And we we do that through uh, a variety of filtration, winterization being one of the processes. But the main process is distillation. So what distillation does is it actually um, molecularly evaporates the THC molecule based upon its uh, its weight. So different molecules have different evaporation temperatures based upon their weight and their chemical properties. And if we know where these, where these fluctuation points are, we're able to separate each molecule individually. So that's what's happening with the distillate is we're taking that crude oil. We know where that, they call it a fraction point. We know where that fraction is for THC and we fractionate it out through distillation. And what the resulting factor is, is you have a very concentrated form of THC it's very, very stable. And, you know, it may be anywhere between 85 to 95 percent THC concentrate by weight. The rest of it is generally minor cannabinoids, whether it's CBC or uh, CBN or, you know, THCV or whatever it is, um, uh, uh, generally a profile of the additional minors. So this product then becomes very stable as a THC, um, as a THC stable product, as a product that has a requisite or repeatable amount of THC in it every time. So it's a very excellent base for a lot of products because when you go to um, buy a Pepsi, you want the Pepsi to taste like Pepsi every time. In order to do that, they need to have stable ingredients. So the distillate product to your original question is found in pretty much, I'd say 60% of products across the shelf. The main constitutes would be vape pens, they'd be edibles, they'd be topicals, they'd be um, tinctures, things like that are very, very common to have distillate in. 
because if I'm making a vape pen and I want to combine it with a ter certain terp terpenoid profile or terpene profile, which I can blend back in, I can have that same stable 90% distillate every single time, as opposed to if I'm doing it strain specific, the, it's going to be completely dependent upon the strain because the strain, one strain may be, you know, 60% extract, the other might be 75. You, you'll be inducing a different effect every time, which is completely dependent on the original genetic of the plant and how that genetic of the plant is producing those cannabinoid profiles. Whereas distillate is completely opposite. You're obviously, you're fractionating that THC and you're creating kind of what I would argue to be a commodity-based product um, with that psychoactive ingredient being THC and then stably replicating that through many products in the market. And now your system, your the, the technique, I should say, that you guys developed, I guess it's a technique, it's called the TSEP. Now, how does that improve the the that separation? Sure, so, so TSEP is actually a technology for hemp. So hemp is kind of the exact opposite of 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 distillate, of THC, traditional THC distillate. So um, everybody may or may not be aware, but hemp is defined by law. Um, technically, the hemp plant is a cannabis plant, and everything is a hybrid nowadays. So what we're really talking about is we're talking about a, a, a cannabis plant that has a THC content of less than 0.3%. So when we have a THC content of less than 0.3%, it's classified by law as hemp. That means you can grow it outside, you can grow it on an industrial scale, you can put you know thousands of acres in the ground um, as long as you're below that 0.3 THC um, by, by weight on your dried flower or your dried, dried hemp plant. But what happens is if we have 0.3% THC in that hemp plant in the original plant, when we extract it, obviously everything's getting concentrated. So now we have a crude oil or a, a distillate of CBD that has anywhere between, we'll say, you know, 1% to 3% THC that then throws it above the threshold of hemp classification. And that's what we call hot oil. We call it, you know, the batch is hot because it has too much THC to be legal. So the remediation of, of the THC from that CBD distillate or from that CBD crude oil is a, um, is a key process. And up until now, the only methodology to do that was um, either reverse phase flash chromatography or standard chromatography. So these are basically, uh, in layman's terms, a filtration method uh, that are very inefficient, they're very slow, and they have a very high cost to operate because of the media used and the loss of the cannabinoids within the media. So the, the key component is with this TSEP, it's a, it's a solvent-based process that we were able to work about nine months and figure out how to, again, separate that THC molecule out, isolate it, and leave behind the purified CBD along with all of the purified minor cannabinoids. And that's exactly what TSEP does. So we can take that crude oil that becomes hot out of the hemp field, we can subtract that THC or remediate that THC out with the TSEP process in a very, very efficient form, of, a form that I should mention is about 25 to 35 times more efficient than standard chromatography. And we're able to do that at a very, very low cost of about $3.50 per liter of crude oil um, being processed, as opposed to chromatography is about $350 per liter uh, to remediate the THC out. So that's where that process comes in. And that's the distinction between, you know, the, the, the tea free or the THC free distillate um, for CBD oil and CBD vape pens. You know, they want all these products to be THC free. And this is the methodology on how we get there. Both of those systems, both of those techniques, I mean, how, how scalable are they? I mean, what is the biggest you guys can put together and what's the smallest for like, let's say someone who's starting out? Sure. Yep. So, so we have two standardized sizes um, for the LSEP. The standardized throughput is seven liters. I'm sorry, for the TSEP, the, the standardized throughput is seven liters uh, per hour, which is quite sizable. And for the LSEP, it's uh, up to 60 liters per hour. Now, these processes are scalable. Um, we have many industrial clients. You know, With the advent of the hemp uh, boom last year, we, we picked up many industrial clients, many large-scale producers that really are um, talking about you know, processing 10,000 pounds a day and things like that, as opposed to batch processors where you might be at a couple hundred pounds a day. So these processes are scalable to really any scale, theoretically. Um, you know, when we get into custom projects and custom engineering, you know, we're very ca cautious about, you know, how our company expends resources and I mean, who, whom we're doing this for and um, how, you know, 
those processes come together because it does take a tremendous amount of management and work from an engineering and integration standpoint. Um, but uh, we were able to scale any of these processes to any size. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about some realities about what has to happen when we do decide to buy extraction equipment because since cannabis isn't legal federally, there really aren't any safety guidelines for some of this equipment. While some of this equipment seems to be used from other industries, seems to be, you know, crossed over from other industries, you know, how do you, how do I as an owner, let's say I get some of your equipment, it gets shipped out here to California. What do I have to do to get that equipment to get certified and recognized as safe? Sure, absolutely. So um, the first thing that I would say is that over the last two years, there's been a pretty good construct built in terms of, you know, regulation of cannabis extraction equipment. And there's a lot of industrial engineering codes that uh, duplicate into this space that are now being used by the local fire marshals and the local authorities having jurisdiction. So the first thing that you absolutely want to do is you want to work with a company um, like Precision or similar that really has um, a long history of working in the space. Not only do they have a long history, but um, they also have uh, all their equipment pre-certified and compliant. And any equipment company that you speak to, so long as you know they are reputable and well-established, they're going to tell you that they already have engineering peer reviews, that they already are certified in jurisdictions where they need to operate, and so forth. So, with that being said, um, you know there's a number of different codes that are. Uh, representative in any jurisdiction that you go to. Um, NFP 58 is a big one. The ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, is a, a big one that regulates extraction equipment. Um, there's also, you know, some some lesser codes that are coming in right now and some compliance for safety standard codes like GMP and good manufacturing practices. So the framework is there. There is a tremendous amount of, of actual um, regulation in the industry right now. So Anybody who's meeting or exceeding the regulation is is going to be safe, and um, the regulators know what to look for. And from a, from a consumer standpoint, or from a um, a client base standpoint, if you're a client that is looking to purchase equipment, you just really ultimately need to work with a reputable company and work with people that know what they're doing in terms of you know having the established equipment and and being safe and and so forth. And then you're pretty much you're pretty much good from there. Um, the extraction equipment companies will guide you through uh, the process. They will, you know, hand over certifications and so forth and can help you normally most can help you deal with your fire marshal and your authority having jurisdiction. Uh, if there's also, you know, somebody that you should really enlist is, is you should list a, a design or engineering architecture firm that really has done this before. And when I say um, done this before. I don't mean, oh, you know, we designed a grow and now we're going to design you an extraction lab. Look for somebody that's designed 50, 60, 70 extraction labs, particularly somebody that's worked in your jurisdiction and somebody that knows um, what your jurisdiction requires because the, the codes do vary a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Yeah, I want to stress that point that it is really important, especially once you start really thinking about and looking into investing in equipment, extraction equipment, to find a professional who has done it before. There are yep. a, um, a lot of pitfalls, and they're going to help you navigate those. This is not something you want to try and learn and do it on yourself or through the Internet. It's not going to fucking work. <laughs> you, yep. It is not yep. going to work, man. Find that professional. Now, also, I, with that, as far as you know, getting equipment certified let's take another step and talk a little bit about how important it is to train people properly on equipment i mean because it's not as easy as just pulling somebody off the line and say hey i'm going to teach you how to do this in 15 minutes no no definitely not so um you basically have two options when it comes to you know bringing in qualified professionals one is you can try to find somebody that already has experience obviously you know hiring people and being solely reliant upon them um is obviously not the most adventitious, uh, adventitious business position to take. The other option is to work with an organization such as Precision or a consulting organization or something like that that really has a really robust um, integration and training staff. So, uh, again, what I touched on at the beginning is, is a big part of what we do is not just sell you equipment. We'll make sure that we're standing there, we're training your staff, we're putting together standard operating procedures. We are 
uh, fully integrating that equipment until ultimately you're making the product, your end, end product that's desirable and the end product that you want to make. So that's really ultimately what you can do is work with a, uh, a professional organization. And when you do so, um, it's, it's fairly easy to find qualified individuals in terms of if you find people that have worked in a lab, people that have chemical background, manufacturer background, people that understand mechanics, um, generally what we find is those people are, are pretty well trainable, pretty easily trainable. And when you put them um, with uh, individuals such as our, our training staff or our qualified technicians from our organization, if they have the right technical mind and the mechanical skill set, they can pick up on it pretty fast. And um, I think that that generally, you know, if I was starting from the beginning, that's generally a better way um, to start rather than to hire somebody that thinks they know what they're doing because everybody comes with bad habits, I feel like. Um, obviously, there's exceptions to the rule, but you, the last thing you want to be is solely reliant upon a single employee to, you know, run your, run your processing um, without having a fundamental understanding and a support structure. Um, should something happen to that employee or you decide, you know, you don't like them or, you know, they're a pain in the ass or whatever it is. So um, these are all things that, you know, just want to take prudent paths to consider all of the possibilities. And these are all services that, you know, as part of what has made Precision successful is we are there to support our clients. We do understand uh, these pitfalls, the the uh, potential uh, basically hurdles that you're going to face in starting a business like this. And the guys that, you know, we have in our company, um, we've all been in this, you know, seven, eight, 10 years. Uh, we all come from the cannabis industry and we're paired with a team of professional engineers and a lot of other professional individuals around us. So I think that our, our infrastructure is very deep, very strong. And ultimately um, when leveraged in the right way, it makes all of our clients very strong as well. So I want to ask you about um, color remediation. Uh, specifically color remediation um, using silica because and I find it interesting at least you know some of the parallels between like winemaking and cannabis extracts because I also know that silica is sometimes used in winemaking to kind of clear it up because you know wine can get a little cloudy sometimes I mean when would an extraction company use color remediation yeah so so color remediation is a um, a fairly new We'll call it a new tech, but it's been around for quite a while. And basically what you're doing with color remediation is you're just using a number of what's called adsorbents. Um, and adsorbents can be, like you said, silica. They can also be diatomaceous earth. They can be uh, activated carbon, uh, bentonite clays, all sorts of different things like that. And basically what these are is they're, they're selective adsorbents. So what happens is when you pass a solvent and oil mixture through this, certain uh, adsorbents have... Um, certain affinities for certain molecules. So think of it kind of like a lock and key or like, you know, polar opposite magnets. So when you pass, for example, a poorly colored or darkly colored extract through activated carbon, um, generally it's going to come out clearer because the activated carbon has a certain affinity to pick up chlorophylls. And these, you know, this science gets pretty deep in terms of you can mix these different uh, medias, you can combine them, you can um, you can press them, you can, you can uh, have them at different uh, densities, different uh, pressures, different temperatures, different throughputs. And, and ultimately, it's a, it's a field of science in itself. But you can manipulate effectively um, those media to provide you a remediated output product that may be remediated of, what, of whatever um, adulterant is in your original, uh, your original micella. We call the micella a... Um, you know, it's basically the solvent and the and the extract together we call a micella. So whatever's undesirable in that original micella, um, we can take that out. And whether that's, you know, whether that's pesticides, whether that's, you know, too much chlorophyll, whether that's um, just undesirable components that we're trying to get rid of that we don't really know what they are, but we know a certain combination of silicas um, or certain combination of medias will will uh, remove those undesirable components and that's ultimately what we're after but um yeah very relevant um yet very complex uh, field of study and science within uh the extraction space so color remediation isn't just solely about um making it look pretty or making it look better because i mean that's <clears throat> excuse me again uh, that that's one of the you know, one of the big driving factors is how clear does it look. So we're just not talking about making it look prettier because, you know, we want it to have, let's call it bag appeal. 
you're also taking out other adulterates? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, we can take out anything um, with the right adsorbent and the right uh, criteria for remediation, um, whether, again, whether that's pesticides, whether that's odors, whether that's colors, um, whether that's in, in, in increase in purification or purity. Um, these are all things that are within the realm of possibility. Wow, far out, man. Thanks. I, I appreciate the uh, you helping me out with that because the first time I read sure. about it, I was like, hey, cause, I mean, I, I don't use, you know, vape pens or anything like that. And I was wondering, wow, are they uh, trying to trick people into thinking they're getting better quality extracts because they're cleaning it up? So, Nick, brother, is there uh, anything you want to talk about, like anything you want to mention industry-wise or especially right now with everybody, well, most of the world quarantine stuck at home? I think that um, the only one thing I'd like to say is just the sentiment around the industry. Um, I know everybody's a little bit scared right now. Everybody's a little bit shook um, due to not only the concerns about the virus, but probably moreover, in most cases, the economic impact. Um, a lot of people facing loss of income and, and so forth. Um, but I just, you know, would say that everything does cycle through. Uh, everything, everything will get better and, and it'll be over with time. And as it pertains to the cannabis industry, it's actually interesting because um, it's a it's a very unique proposition. And generally in in these economies, you know, whether you agree morally with this or not, people tend to use um, mind altering substances or things like uh, THC at an increased rate, um, as well as alcohol and, and any other what we call change of state products. So. In the event, you know, that we're looking at a longer economic cycle here, which I do believe that we are to some degree, it's not going to be a, a V-shaped recovery, as some people say. Um, cannabis is actually a very, very good space to be in, uh, hemp and cannabis in particular, because these are um, consumer-based products that consumers are going to continue to consume. And, that, you know, <laughs> you could argue that they're almost like consumer staples, although, you know, I couldn't, can't really say that. But... Um, people that, that generally and habitually smoke cannabis or um, consume hemp products are not going to stop that due to, you know, the economic, uh, the economic impact of what's going on here. So what we see in Michigan is, you know, there's literally lines around the block at all the dispensaries. Our clients, what our clients are telling us is our clients are telling us, you know, we can't stop any of our plans. Can you get everybody back to work? Because we need our equipment. We need you guys to get out here and train us. We need to, you know, get installs done. We need to move forward with our business plans because we've got orders coming in left and right because that consumption base is absolutely so strong in an economic environment like this. So, um, you know, for those of you that are listening, that are thinking, you know, oh, economic downturn, I don't want to make a move. I don't want to, I don't want to proceed uh, with, you know, my business plans or whatever it is. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think right now is probably one of the best times to build. Um, you know, the, 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 the chaos of the market has calmed down a little bit enough to where uh, you can really focus and have a clear vision. And I think that being in the THC and CBD and, 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 and that market space in particular is probably um, one of the absolute best economic positions or, or niches in the economy that you can be in in a uh, in an environment like this and especially provided if it's going to be a longer cycle which uh myself and many of my constituents also believe so um that's you know that's what i would say you know keep your heads up and um you know that the cannabis industry will continue to grow regardless of what's happening with the outside noise yeah brother i mean you make a good point as far as the conversation that has to be had of the importance of having an escape there's nothing wrong with having an escape like um cannabis or alcohol now there's also nothing wrong with harm reduction with replacing cannabis with replacing cannabis instead of alcohol you know absolutely you know, both of those things you know, are okay they're okay yeah, adults man. should be able to do whatever they want to do yeah in you a know? safe manner so. and at the very least you should be okay to have the conversation in public man out loud right especially now yep you know uh Nick, brother, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me, uh, to get on the show and just uh, help us uh, understand what you guys do over at Precision Extract Solutions and a little bit about, you know, some of the processes in making cannabis and hemp extracts. Um, can you do me a favor, let everybody know how they can find you, how they can find uh, Precision Extraction Solutions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just type Precision Extraction into Google and, and we'll pop up. If not, it's precisionextraction.com. All of our Instagram and social media handles are at Precision Extraction. And uh, if you want to give us a ring, the number is 
420-0020. And we are still working. We're, we're busy and uh, our people are in the office. We're happy to help you with anything that you need. Far out, man. Far out. Thanks a lot. Um, don't hang up, Nick. Everybody else. Okay. I'm going to play a little bit of music and uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> Well, there you go, everyone. Just a little window in what it takes to make those cannabis and hemp extracts. Once again, I want to thank Nick Tennant for uh, taking the time, man, to be on the show. I truly do appreciate that. And if you have a question or a comment about this episode, uh, you can send me an email. That is inmygrow at gmail.com. Or you can find us on social media platforms at In My Grow Show. Well, mis amigos, my friends, you know what? That's the end of my notes. That is all I have to share with you today. I want to thank all the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. Now, if you are a cannabis company and want to advertise with our worldwide audience, you know, sort of let everyone know what you're doing and what new things you've got going on, you can send me an email that is inmygrow at gmail.com, and we will absolutely figure out the best way to do that for you. Now, as always, if this show has given you value, if it's educated you, if it's made you think, if it's given you a little escape from your day, do us a favor and help us out with the financial donation. All amounts are welcomed and appreciated. $1, $2, $5, a million dollars, whatever you got, it's okay. You can go over to patreon.com slash inmygrow to make that donation. Another way to help out is that you can go to the website inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab, you can buy a t-shirt. You can also use PayPal, that is inmygrow at gmail.com to leave that donation. And yet another way to help the show financially is before you go shopping on Amazon, click on the Amazon link at the top of the show notes so that they know that we sent you, the show gets a commission, and it doesn't cost you anything. Now, as always, if you can't support the show financially, don't worry about that, man. I get it. Okay, here's how you can help the show, though. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. Leave a rating and a review. Then go to the website, inmygrow.com. Subscribe to the website. And go to YouTube. Search for the In My Grow Show with Alex. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then after you do all that subscribing, just tell three other people about the show. Really simple, just three. You can tell more if you want, for sure, but, you know, at least three. All right, brothers and sisters, well, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. I think I've said enough today. Remember that I love you all very much, and to always grow, learn, and teach.